This conference will now be recorded. Okay, so I'm Dr. Rashmi Patil. I, on behalf of uh, RAISE Academy, I welcome you all to the uh, session on gestational trophoblastic disease. And this is going to be covered by Dr. Geetika Arora. So she's the mentor for the MRCOG part two from RAISE Academy. Uh, welcome Dr. Geetika Arora. And I would also like to welcome Dr. Abu Mustafa here. It is uh, such a wonderful pleasure, sir, to have you in this meeting. I welcome you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Arasi. Yeah, it's great uh, to, to have you here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Geetika, if you can take over yeah. the presentation yeah. here, you can put yes. on the slide too. Uh, yes, am, am, am I audible? Uh, yes, dear. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Geetika, one of the mentors from Rays Academy. And yes, uh, this is my first meeting with you all. And I welcome you all to the learning session. So uh, today we'll be covering a very important green top guideline that is gestational trophoblastic diseases. It has come up new in uh, June 2020 and uh, they have made some changes with regards to the previous GTG. So let's see uh, what the GTG has to say. Okay, so just say should, uh, can you please mute everyone? Can you please be on the mute mode? Okay, so yes, what is gestation trophoblastic disease? So gestation trophoblastic disease, as the name suggests, it is a, a disease which is arising from the trophoblast. And it is a spectrum of diseases uh, which span from the pre-malignant conditions. These pre-malignant conditions are the complete and the partial mole. And uh, it goes to the malignant conditions and the malignant conditions we have in gestational trophoblastic diseases. They are invasive mole, choriocarcinoma, and placental site trophoblastic tumor, epithelioid trophoblastic tumor, and uh, there are some placental site nodules also. Though placental site nodules, they uh, many of them, they are typical nodules and we need not follow them. But sometimes, yes, the nodules can be atypical and this can progress to uh, gestation trophoblastic neoplasia. The risk is 10 to 15%. And we really have to look after them. So this gestation trophoblastic disease, it is a spectrum. So it encompasses all these pre-malignant to malignant conditions. Just a second. So now let's see what are, firstly, we will see what is uh, the uh, molar and the partial molar pregnancies. Okay, so there are multiple questions which are asked from this slide. So a complete mole is deployed in nature, whereas a partial mole is triploid in nature. And the uh, genetic makeup here is 69XXY in most of the cases. That is in 90% it is triploid and a among this triploid, the most common genetic makeup is 69XXY. The other genetic makeup can be 69XYY and 69XXX. Whereas in complete mole, the genetic makeup is deployed in nature. And in 75 to 80% of the cases, it is 46XX. Why does complete mole occur? It occurs because a single sperm, which has a normal genetic material, that is 23X, it fuses with an empty ova, and then it duplicates its own chromosome. This is known as androgenesis. And this results in the formation of 46XX chromosome, and the entire set of chromosome is coming from the father, or it is paternal in origin. There is no maternal genetic makeup in complete mole. 
In 20 to 25 of percent of the cases, uh, this complete mold can result because of diaspermic fertilization of empty ova. That means two sperms, that is 23X and 23Y, they fuse together with the empty ova, and this results in 46XY chromosome. In complete mold, there won't be any fetus, no blood cells. Whereas in partial mold, which in most of the cases is triploid in nature, how does it occur? It occurs when two set of paternal haploid chromosomes, they fuse with one set of maternal haploid chromosome. So the, uh, the ova has a uh, normal chromosome, even the sperms have normal chromosomes, but two sperms, they are fusing with a single ova. So this is resulting in the formation of triploid uh, pattern. And in 90%, this is triploid. In 10% of the cases, it can be tetraploid or mosaic. So this is another uh, single best answer, which is uh, asked in exam. In partial mole, how is it different from complete mole? In partial mole, there are a genetic maker from the mother also. So that's why it is staining with P57 uh, allele, that is the gene. So once uh, it is not sure what are the pathologists doing, they are doing immunohistochemistry. They are staining the tissue with P57 gene. And yes, the partial mole takes up the gene because it has maternal chromosomes in it, whereas complete mole doesn't have any maternal chromosomes. The, all the set of chromosomes, they are coming from uh, the father that is paternal in origin. Okay, I hope it's clear up to now. Any doubts, you can just put it in the chat box. So partial moon will have evidence of fetus or fetus red blood cell. That's why we are saying that we have to give NTD injection when we are treating a partial mold. But the latest guideline does say that you have to give NTD injection uh, uh, because the diagnosis, the histological diagnosis is not evident till three days. It takes around five to six days for the report to appear. And we all know that the histological diagnosis is the gold standard for diagnosis. So we can't wait for uh, the injection to be given at a later date. So that's why in all the cases of molar pregnancy now, it's a routine that we are giving NTD injection within 72 hours. I'm not able to change my slide. Uh, click on the slide once, Gitika, and then change the slide with the, the button. Actually, I think I have uh, taken this drawing tool. No, that's why it's not changing. Uh, just click once on the yeah. okay yeah 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 yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah so this slide uh, i have already described uh, that uh, this is um, a complete mole occurs because of the a single sperm single haploid uh, sperm fusing with an empty ova and then duplicating its own chromosome sometimes it can occur because of the diaspermic fusion of with an empty ova Whereas the partial mode, it occurs because two sperms they are fusing with empty over. Okay, so this is the same uh, thing which I have described. Some problem with it. change in the slide. Uh, try to double click and see once, Kitika. No, I think this drawing tool is coming again and again. No. Hmm. 
Okay, so uh, the incidence of gestation trophoblastic disease in UK is one in 714. So this is another important question asked. And the Asian females, they have a higher tendency to have uh, gestation trophoblastic diseases. And the extremes of age, extremes of age, that is any female who is less than 15 years or more than 50 years, they are at a higher risk of having these gestation trophoblastic diseases. Uh, the incidence of gestation trophoblastic disease after a live birth. So gestation trophoblastic neoplasias, they can arise after any pregnancy event, after abortions, after uh, any uh, molar pregnancies, after live births. So the incidence, this incidence is important that the gestation trophoblastic neoplasias are occurring after live birth is one in 50,000. Now, what is the presentation? How do they, the females they present to us? So the most common presentation uh, in 60% of the cases, the patient will have irregular vaginal bleeding and uh, there will be a positive pregnancy test and definitely an ultrasound when we are doing it, it shows classic snowstorm appearance in complete mold. Less common presentation can be hyperemesis, excessive uterine enlargement uh, because of the exuberant growth of the trophoblastic tissue. Uh, there can be hyperthyroidism because uh, the HCG hormone, it has homology with uh, the thyroid stimulating hormone. So it, uh, the patient can have hyperthyroidism. There can be early onset preeclampsia and there can be abdominal distinction because of theca luteal cyst. Rarely the patient can have, can present with metastatic disease as well. So this can be hemoptysis if the embolization is to the lungs when there is coughing out of the blood. And if it is to the brain, the patient can have seizures. As so now let's see what is the ultrasound feature. So in complete mold, we all know that this is a typical snowstorm appearance. So this is a very important question. They give you the picture in part three also, they provide you with the picture and they um, ask you regarding the management and what is the diagnosis. So you should be aware how the picture of a molar pregnancy looks like. So it is typical snowstorm appearance. And in between five to seven days, there will be a polypoidal mass. And after eighth week, there will be thick consisting appearance of Will's tissue with no identified gestational sac. In partial mole, the ultrasound features, they are subtle, okay? And we normally confuse this partial mole with um, many um, uh, like missed abortion or degenerating fibroids. So normally the partial mole diagnosis is, uh, the ultrasound is less specific uh, as compared to the complete mole. Here, uh, the anterior posterior to transverse diameter, if we say of the gestational sac, is greater than one is to 1.5. That is the anterior posterior diameter uh, the, becomes less as compared to the transverse diameter. So this is again an important question, which is asked in exam in the ultrasound features of the molar partial molar pregnancy. How do you uh, diagnose? So as already discussed, the definitive diagnose is, is made by histological examination and ploidy status and immunohistochemistry staining with P57, which is a paternally impregnated gene and expressed from the maternal allele. That's why the partial mole, it gives us a positive staining with P57, whereas a complete mole, it doesn't give any staining. So this is how we differentiate. and. Ploidy, as we all know, that complete moles, they are deployed in nature and partial moles, they are triploid in nature. So this is how we differentiate partial mole from the complete mole. How do we treat this patient now? So uh, the treatment of choice is suction and curatage. Okay, we are not going for medical line of management here because any prostaglandins given uh, in this kind of patients, they can lead to strong myometrial contraction and there can be trophoblastic embolization of the tissue. And this can be a life-threatening complication for the mother. That's why the treatment of choice is the suction and curatage. However, 
in partial mole, if the fetal parts are large in size, then sometimes suction and curettage is not possible. In that case, we go for medical line of method, medical med management. And this suction and curettage uh, ideally should be an ultrasound guided. Why? Because there are high chances of perforation. When we are doing suction and evacuation, there are high chances of uh, perforation of the uterus. And also to make sure that we have removed the entire tissue, it is important that ultrasound guidance, uh, curettage, suction and curettage is done. As already told, NTD prophylaxis is recommended following removal of molar pregnancy. Let's see what, what the GTG has to say in this. So the GTG says that poor vascularization of chorionic villi and absence of D antigen by trophoblast cell means that NTD prophylaxis is not required for complete molar pregnancy. However, it is required for partial molar pregnancy. Confirmation of diagnosis of complete molar pregnancy may not occur for some time after removal, which could delay administration of NTD. So that's why we are giving. Otherwise, it's not required because the histological diagnosis, it takes time. That's why we are giving NTD injection. So uh, all cases of molar pregnancy, which are dealt and uh, are given NTD injection within 72 hours. What about preparing the cervix immediately prior to the uterine removal? So here uh, the GTG says that uh, rightening of the cervix with either physical dilators or prostaglandins prior to the uterine removal is not associated with increased risk of developing GTN. However, uh, preparation of the cervix long before the surgical evacuation is not recommended because again, uh, because of the prostaglandins which we are giving may stimulate the myometrial contractions and this can lead to embolization of trophoblastic tissue into the venous system and this can be life-threatening. So that's why, but immediate preparation of the service just two to three hours before the procedure is safe. So can oxytocics infusion be used during surgical removal? So uh, yes, this is again a very important question. The use of oxytocic infusion prior to completion of the removal is not recommended. Again, the theory is the same. When we are giving oxytocics, there will be myometrial contraction, there will be trophoblastic embolization, and we don't want that thing to occur. That's why we are not giving oxytocic infusion in routine. However, if the patient is having heavy bleeding when we are doing the procedure and the patient starts to bleed torrentially in that case the first step we have to do is to expedite the surgical removal and this should always be done under consultant guidance this is very important so the procedure needs to be expedited and the need of oxytocin infusion there should be weighed against the risk of tissue embolization. So there comes the role of oxytocin infusion. If the patient is torrentially bleeding, we are doing the procedure, the patient has started bleeding, what to do? We have to hasten our procedure, we have to do it fast, and we have to see whether this oxytocin infusion will control her bleeding or not. Uh, there was another uh, uh, dilemma regarding this question in the previous GTG. That is, uh, what is the role of repeat surgical removal uh, and when it is indicated and what is the time, timing? So normally, uh, there is, uh, if there is no acute compromise, then the repeat surgical procedure should not be done and it should be done only after consultation with the relevant GTG referral center. But if the patient is bleeding heavily or persistently and the patient has acute hemodynamic compromise, 
the patient is bleeding excessively and we see on ultrasound that there are retained pregnancy tissue presence. In that case, there is a role of urgent surgical management. So we have done the case, the patient has gone home, the patient has come again with excessive bleeding we did a scan, we found that their pregnancy tissue is uh, there and the patient is hemodynamically unstable, then yes, we have to go for repeat surgical management. Consideration can be given to balloon tamponade or uterine artery embolization to reduce the risk of hysterectomy for women who wishes to preserve fertility. Bleeding from the metastatic vaginal metastasis should not be done anything but just a vaginal pack has to be introduced. So this is the scan come as a question. So if the patient comes with bleeding from the vaginal metastasis, because we know the most common in case of choriocarcinoma, the most common site is suburethral area in the vagina. So the patient can bleed, bleed torrentially from that site. If the patient comes with bleeding, then we just have to do a gentle vaginal packing for her. Should the pregnancy tissue from all the miscarriages be examined histologically? Yes, the histological assessment of material, which is obtained from medical or surgical management of all the miscarriages is recommended. So whenever a mother is having a miscarriage, it is recommended that this tissue should be sent for histological examination unless and until fetal parts had been identified on ultrasound before. Because then we need not worry if we have, if we know that, okay, the fetal parts were there on the scan and now the mother has miscarried, then there is no issue. But if we never knew, if we never knew that there were fetal parts, then definitely all these tissues has to be sent for histological examination. We need to know that this was not a molar pregnancy. And all the women who have received care for miscarriage, they are recommended to have a urine for pregnancy test three weeks after miscarriage. What about in abortion? So if we are doing any abortion, should, should the pregnancy tissue send in that case? The risk of GTN after therapeutic abortion is to the tune of one in 20,000. There is no need to routinely send the pregnancy tissue for histological examination, provided the fetal parts had been identified at the time of surgical abortions or on prior ultrasound examination. Okay, when we are doing surgical termination, we saw that, okay, these are the normal fetal tissues which, we are, which is coming out. Or in the ultrasound prior to done, priorly done, it is clear that, okay, fetal parts were pre present. Then in that case, no need to send. Otherwise, we have to send all the pregnancy tissue. Again, the women who are, have undergone medical abortion should be recommended to have a urine for pregnancy test three weeks after the procedure. So how should women with elevated uh, human chorion gonadotrophin after possible pregnancy tissue be managed? So, okay, uh, pregnancy has occurred, pregnancy event is over. Now the patient has persistently elevated HCG levels. How to deal with it? You have to refer the patient to GTG center. All the patients with persistently elevated HCG values levels should be referred to GTG after ectopic has been excluded, okay? You have to exclude the ectopic and then, okay, you have excluded, there is no ectopic, then definitely these patients should be referred to GTG. Or after two consecutive treatments with methotrexate for pregnancy of unknown location has failed. Even after giving methotrexate for two times in PUL, even if the HCG levels are high, then these patients should be sent to GTG center. GTG can develop after any pregnancy event, as already told, and failure to treat uh, GTN can be fatal. GTN requires more uh, intensive chemotherapy than treatment for pregnancy of unknown location. Very rarely, some females will have HCG with, uh, uh, they, there is familiar rise in HCG levels, 
the line has not been written correctly there is familial rise in hcg levels and the hcg are persistently between 10 to 200 international units per liter so there these there are some cases like this also where there is familial hcg rise in the levels blood levels low levels of hcg can be found with female germ cell tumor some epithelial cancer including bladder breast lung stomach cancer colorectal cancer and low level of hcg elevation can also be caused by presence of pituitary hcg or presence of human anti mouse antibodies the hcg is a glycoprotein which is which can be present in many forms both in the sera as well as in the urine it can be an intact hcg a free beta hcg subunit nicked hcg hcg beta core fragment now we have to know that the molar pregnancies and gtn they produce all these variants of hcg and most commercial hcg assay they uh, which we are routinely uh, using in the lab they do not measure all the hcg variant however the three uk gtg centers we have that is in uh, dundee and london and sheffield they use specialized in house hcg assay to detect all forms of hcg so it is very important that all these patients they should be referred to gtg center because the routine lab assays which are done outside they are not detecting all the forms of scg so these patients they need to be followed at a dedicated centers in one of the three centers which women should be investigated for gtn after known molar pregnancy so it was not a molar pregnancy now it was a known molar pregnancy and you are suspecting gtn when are you suspecting gtn any women who develops persistent vaginal bleeding after pregnancy event is at a risk of having gtn any persistent vaginal bleeding after any pregnancy event may it be an abortion or molar pregnancy a live birth anything if the mother is having persistent vaginal bleeding she is at a risk of having gtn a urine hcg test should be performed in all cases of persistent or irregular vaginal bleeding lasting for more than 8 weeks after pregnancy event okay the mother had a delivery 8 weeks back and still her urine is showing hcg it can be gtn you have to refer this patient to gtg center it is uncommon for gtn to develop in women who have normal hcg urine or serum levels within 8 weeks of removal of molar pregnancy so if uh, hcg normally we are following molar pregnancy for how many weeks we are following for 8 the we say that the hcg level should come back to normal within 56 days that is eight weeks because after this period there is less than one in hundred chance that the patient may have gtn so it is important that uh, we do if there is irregular or persistent vaginal bleeding we do a urine for pregnancy test uh, eight weeks after the pregnancy event sometimes the patient can present with dyspnea hemoptysis new onset scissors paralysis and uh, can rarely occur biopsy of secondary deposits in the vagina sometimes the patient can come to us with the vaginal mets can the patient can come with so it's important that we do not biopsy the, those mets because uh, they can be torrential bleeding okay so we have to take care Choriocarcinoma is estimated to occur in 1 in 50,000 pregnancies. This I have already discussed. So vaginal bleeding is the most common uh, symptom of GTN, which develops after miscarriage, after therapeutic abortion, or postpartum hemorrhage. The, worst, the prognosis of women with GTN after known molar pregnancy may be worse owing to the delay in diagnosis we are following molar pregnancies we are routinely following 
that's why the progno prognosis there is good whereas in any other pregnancy event we may miss the diagnosis we not keep in mind the gtn developing of gtn therefore there can be delay in diagnosis and this can be uh, like uh, this can uh, delay the diagnosis and this can lead to worse prognosis how should suspected ectopic molar pregnancy in women be managed so cases of uh, women with ectopic pregnancy suspected to be molar in nature should be managed as any other case of ectopic pregnancy but here if there is local tissue diagnosis if in our hospital we have made a diagnosis of okay this ectopic pregnancy tissue which was present was molar then we have to send this tissue to a higher center to a center with appropriate expertise for the pathological review again multiple questions coming from this side this slide how is twin pregnancy of a viable fetus and presumptive coexisting molar pregnancy managed so women diagnosed with combined molar pregnancy and viable twin or where there is a diagnostic doubt should be referred to regional fetal medicine center so whenever there is a doubt that it is a twin with one viable fetus one mole or we are in uh, in uh, dilemma that it is a partial mole where a part of fetus is seen along with the trophoblastic tissue so in these cases these patients need to be referred to fetal medicine center and gtg center in there is increased risk of perinatal morbidity and outcome for gtn prenatal invasive testing for fetal karyotype should be considered in case where it is unclear if the pregnancy is a complete mole with coexisting normal twin or possibly singleton partial molar pregnancy so how can we differentiate that it is a partial mole or it is a twin with normal uh, one baby and one uh, molar pregnancy so it can be done by fetal karyotyping so prenatal invasive fetal karyotyping will be done in uh, fetal medicine center and what is the outcome of the uh, baby the normal baby if it is a twin with one normal and one molar pregnancy so there will be early fetal loss in 40% of the cases there will be premature birth in 36% of the cases incidence of preeclampsia it's more and uh, the rate is as high as 20% though the risk of gtn is not increased with twins one viable and one uh, molar so all these percentages they are very important again they are asked in exam and they ask they will give you the scenario okay you have a, a twin uh, a pregnancy where one is a viable fetus and the other they are suspecting a coexisting mole so what will be your next step your next step will be referring the patient to fetal medicine center and the gtg center okay and what will be they doing over there they will be doing prenatal invasive testing or fetal karyotype the slide is very important other forms of gestation trophoblastic neoplasia that is placental side trophoblastic tumors and epithelioid trophoblastic tumors they are rare variety of gtn and they compromise 0.2% of all the gtds they tend to produce less hcg they are confined to uterus for a longer duration of time they more often involve the lymphatics they are more chemo resistant than other forms of gtn for these reasons they are not managed according to their figo score so they are managed by surgery these gtns they are not managed by figo scoring because they are chemo resistant and they uh, they embolize they metabolize uh, the metastasis occur through lymphatics they produce less hcg and the treatment of choice in them is the surgery uh let's see uh, study something about the placental site nodule so if it is a topical a typical nodule then no further monitoring is required in this case however if the placental site nodule is an atypical nodule in that case histology should be reviewed centrally 
this link to cancer, uh, they are uh, the atypical placental site nodules, they are linked to cancer to the tune of 10 to 15 percent. Those females who have completed their fam families may wish to consider going for hysterectomy in the absence of metastatic disease. And those who desire more children, they require more careful counseling and further testing. Now, which all women, they should be referred to gestational uh, trophoblastic centers. Sorry. So all the women who are diagnosed with GTD should be provided with written information about the condition and the need for referral for follow up by GTG, GTD center. Any female who has uh, any form of molar tissue, any form of molar change in the trophoblastic cells should be referred to for uh, the uh, further follow up. May it be complete molar pregnancy, partial molar pregnancy, twin pregnancy with complete or partial mole, placental site trophoblastic tumors, epithelioid trophoblastic tumor, atypical placental site module, limited macroscopic or microscopic molar change suggesting uh, possible early complete or partial molar pregnancy or choriocarcinoma. So any form of molar tissue in the pregnancy the female should be referred to gestational trophoblastic center. So as already discussed, there are three centers we have. One is in Dundee, Sheffield and London. So it is Charing Cross London, Sheffield and Dundee. Normally the patient, whichever the center is nearest to the patient, the patient is referred to there. The complete mole is how the complete mole is followed. So the complete mole is followed uh, in, in, either, in either case, the follow is with, with, is with beta HCG levels, okay? Either we are seeing these beta HCG levels in the blood or in the urine. So they can just, um, they can send the uh, kits, uh, the urine uh, collection kits can be sent to the patients and they can just parcel those kits to the center or they can go to their GP surgery and get the blood tested. So this, they are following it once in two weeks. Okay, so the complete mole is followed once in two weeks. And if beta HCG, it return back, back to normal within 56 days, that is eight weeks, then the follow-up is for six months from the day of evacuation, okay. So we just make this thing clear. If the beta SCG value, it is coming back to normal within eight weeks. So the follow-up is, is for six months from the day of evacuation. However, if beta SCG value doesn't fall back to normal within 56 days, in that case, the follow-up is for six months from the day it normalizes. So it has to be prolonged from the day of normalization we have to further follow this patient for six months now and the follow-up is if uh, once in uh, every fortnightly and once the level it re uh, return back to normal then it is weekly then it is every monthly sorry so firstly we are doing it after every 15 days and once it returns to normal then we are doing it after every fifth, after every one month. Okay, hope it is clear because this is very important. And in case of partial mole, we are following the patient every two weeks. And once it is normal, we are doing another test after four weeks. One we, once we get two results normal, then we uh, stop the follow-up. So the, for the partial mole, it is easy. We need only two results, four weeks apart, which should be negative. However, in complete mode, it goes by the days. If the beta HCG is falling back to normal within 56 days of evacuation, then we have to follow it up for the patient for six months from evacuation. And if it doesn't fall back within 56 days, if, if, if it falls, falls back after 56 days, then in that case, we have to follow the patient for six months after the day it normalizes. So this is very, very important. 
what is the overall risk of developing uh, of uh, requiring chemotherapy so uh, in case of complete mole it is 13 to 16 percent earlier gtg said said that it was 15 percent so now they have given the range it is 13 to 16 percent and for partial mole it is 0.5 to 1 percent the need for chemotherapy these numbers again are very important the new uh, gtg says that we need not follow any further pregnancy with hcg after the pregnancy event is over if the patient has not required chemotherapy so okay uh, let me explain you if this is a molar pregnancy and we have followed and the follow-up is, is complete the patient has not required any chemotherapy then any future pregnancies which the patient will be having we need not send hcg levels in that case after the pregnancy event because earlier they were saying that all the future pregnancies after any molar pregnancy you have to send hcg levels you have to measure hcg between six to eight days but now they have removed if the patient is not receiving chemotherapy then we need not follow the future pregnancies by uh, pregnancy event by hcg why they have said so because they are saying that if the patient didn't require any chemotherapy then the risk of gtd in any subsequent pregnancy event it is very low it is to the tune of one in 4011 okay so we need not follow these patients with hcg uh, levels uh, if they have not required chemotherapy, if they have required chemotherapy, then definitely we have to follow any future pregnancy event. But if the chemotherapy is not required, then we need not follow them. What is the optimum treatment for GTN? Uh, so uh, the GTN can be treated by single agent or multi agent chemotherapy. And whether we have to give single agent or multi agent, it will depend upon uh, the FIGO 2000 scoring system. So here they have given eight prognostic parameters. So these are the eight prognostic parameters. And each parameter is given a score of 0, 1, 2, 4. Okay, and depending upon these parameters, a score is given to any uh, molar pregnancy or any uh, gestational trophoblastic uh, disease. So uh, depending upon the score, we are further treating these patients. If the score is six or less than six, it is a low risk uh, GTD and we have to for, uh, treat this patient with single agent chemotherapy that is methotrexate however if the score is seven or more than seven then we have to treat this patient with multi-agent chemotherapy okay so the parameters the prognostic parameters are the age the antecedent pregnancy we can see that with mole the score is less whereas with live birth the score is high that is it shows a bad prognosis because there is delay in diagnosis. Interval months from the end of index pregnancy to treatment. So it can be less than four, four to seven, seven to 13 and 13 or more than 13. So as the duration of uh, treatment from the index pregnancy, it increases the prognosis, it keeps on getting worse. And this is the most important prognostic factor. The interval month from the end of index pregnancy to the treatment. When we had that pregnancy and when we are starting the treatment, this is the most important prognostic factor which is taken into account. What was the pre-treatment HCG levels? What was the largest tumor size, including the uterus? Less than three, three to five, five or more than five centimeters. What was the size of, what was the site of metastasis? This should be site, if they have written it wrongly. Site of metastasis, whether it was lung, lung score is zero, brain and liver score is high, it is four. 
So they can give you the scenario like uh, they can directly give uh, the patient has come with metastasis to the brain with beta HCG value this and uh, her age is this. So what will be the treatment of your choice? So either it will be single agent, multi agent. So then you have to calculate the score and then you have to give the answer. So that's why this is important chart. Any above one lakh HCG is score four. Uh, if the interval from the index to uh, the treatment is more than 13 months, it is four. If the metastasis is to the liver or brain, it is four. If the number of metastasis is more than eight, it is uh, four. And if there was previous failed chemotherapy, if two or more drugs were given, uh, given and they failed, then again, the risk is uh, score is four. So you have to memorize this table. I have already told this that the most important prognostic factor for adverse outcome is the interval to presentation from the last known and presumed causative pregnancy and interval of more than 48 months um, is uh, that is more than four years has been associated with 100% death rate regardless of the stage. Score six or less, they are low risk, treated with single agent methotrexate, alternating with folinic acid for one week followed by six days rest. Score of seven or more, they are. Index pregnancy means that uh, what was our from, uh, from where we are following, like the after which pregnancy event, is the patient has the patient developed this GTN? Whether it was a miscarriage after which the patient has developed gestation trophoblastic uh, neoplasia, or it was a uh, molar pregnancy after which the uh, patient has developed. So index pregnancy is that pregnancy after which GTN has developed. Okay, hope it is clear. And uh, uh, the in multi agent we are giving uh chema ema co regime that is etoposide methotrexate actinomycin d cyclophosphamide and vincristin so five drugs are being given and uh, they are uh, multi agent when the score is seven or more than seven so here we have to continue the treatment until hcg levels it return back to normal and then further for six consecutive weeks. Okay, we are following HCG in these patients. In molar pregnancy, we were following uh, the HCG every fortnightly, okay, after every two weeks. But here, in when the patient has developed GTN and we are giving chemotherapy, in that case, the HCG level needs to be monitored if twice a week they have to be monitored twice a week and once the hcg level it falls back to normal you have to continue your chemotherapy for further six consecutive weeks because we want all the trophoblastic tissue to be dead okay we don't want any trophoblastic tissue to remain that's why the uh, the follow up should uh, the treatment should be continued for further six weeks after HCG levels have returned to normal. So uh, yeah, this slide I wanted to show you. So how they are giving methotrexate folinic acid. So we can see methotrexate, they are giving alternative way. Okay, so more methotrexate than folinic acid, more methotrexate, folinic acid, methotrexate, folinic acid, methotrexate, folinic acid. So this goes this is the week two they are starting okay so this is going for eight days then six days rest two weeks over then again day one will start they will give methotrexate folinic acid methofoly methofoly then again till eight day then six days rest then again and during the time they are giving this they are doing hcg uh, twice weekly and once the hcg level falls back to normal then further they are giving these drugs for six consecutive weeks which makes three cycle of these drugs. And in EMACO, on day one, they are giving uh, this DEM, that is actinomycin D, etoposide, methotrexate. Then on day two, they are giving uh, actinomycin D, etoposide, folinic acid. Then they come to week two. On day eight, they are giving vincristin and cyclophosphamide. 
two weeks over, then again they will go to week uh, three, day one, day two, day eight. So like this, they are giving the drugs in cycles, okay? And the, uh, these medications, they are continued for uh, for six weeks after HCG levels, they return back to normal. So this makes three cycles of these uh, uh, chemotherapy. What if the score is 13 or more than 13? So the total score here comes out to be, uh, if we calculate the maximum score here, the maximum score comes out to be 25 here. Okay, so four plus four plus four, uh, plus three plus four plus four plus two plus one. So the maximum score in FIGO is 25. If the score is six or less than six, it is low risk disease. If it is seven or more than seven, it is high risk disease. If it is 13 or more than 13, then it is the patient has very, very poor prognosis. There is high risk of early death within four weeks, often because uh, there is bleeding into the organs and late death can be there because of multi-drug resistance. What is the long-term outcome? of women who are treated with GTN. Okay, we have treated the female with GTN. What is the long term? So the outlook of these females, they are excellent and they have an overall cure rate of 100%. Future pregnancies are achieved in 80% of the females following treatment for GTN, either with methotrexate or with multi-agent. So both these two numbers, they are important. There is increased risk of premature menopause for women treated with combination agent chemotherapy. The menopause can occur early than expected for women treated with combination agent. 13% will have premature menopause by the age of 40 years and 36% will have uh, menopause by the age of 45 years. Again, these two numbers, they are important. They have recently added it in the new guideline. Earlier, they were saying that there is one year of premature menopause with single agent and three year premature menopause with multi-agent. But now they have removed that and they have given this number now. Uh, the women, especially those approaching the age of uh, 40 years should be warned of potential negative impact on fertility, particularly when uh, treated with high dose chemotherapy. And earlier they were saying that EMACO regime, the etoposide particularly, no, it causes secondary uh, cancers. Okay, but now they are saying that they have done some case series and all that. They are saying that there is no overall increased risk of secondary cancers for women who are treated with methotrexate alone or EMACO. Earlier they were saying that myeloid leukemias, they were more common with uh, these etoposide medication. But now recently they, the recent studies have uh, say, said that there, are, there is no increased risk. What about subsequent pregnancy? Okay, you have treated the patient now. Uh, we we got we have treated the patient with GTN, and now again the patient is uh, uh, pregnant. So what what is the increased risk in subsequent pregnancy? So the studies do say, according to the GTG, that there is 25% increased risk of preterm birth. Okay, so these females in their future pregnancies they can have increased risk of preterm birth, whereas women with at least one birth between the molar pregnancy and the index pregnancy, index birth, uh, were at increased risk of large for gestational age babies and stillbirths. So immediately after the molar pregnancy, there is increased chances of preterm. And if there is one pregnancy in between, the, if they are studying the third consecutive pregnancy, then then uh, the risk is uh, risk of large for gestational age babies and stillbirth is there. Uh, okay, so now, um, what is the recommended interval between complete and partial molar pregnancy and trying to conceive in future? So women who are advised not to conceive until their follow up is complete, because we all know that pregnancy itself is producing HCG hormone. 
so we are following this patient with hcg how will we follow up when she becomes pregnant as so our follow up will be will get hindered so normally they are advised not to conceive until their follow up is complete and if the patient has received any form of chemotherapy that is imaco or methotrexate then they are advised not to conceive for one year after completion of treatment so this two statements they are again very important then uh, i have already discussed this that women who have a pregnancy following a previous molar pregnancy which has not required treatment for gtn do not need to send a post pregnancy hcg sample even the histological examination of placental tissue from any normal pregnancy after molar pregnancy is not indicated so we have told her that not to get pregnant but how what form of contraception she should use so she can use any form of contraception except intrauterine devices because the uterus is very soft there the uterus is involuting and there are chances that uh, this may cause perforation so earlier they were saying that chc should also not be used but now uh, the uk mec has revised its uh, charts and they say that chc they are category 1 and yes the females they can use combined hormonal progesterone only pills depot metoxy progesterone implants but except intrauterine systems and intrauterine devices these two should not be used they are contraindicated it is important that the patient who have had a removal of molar pregnancy are advised not to get pregnant till they have completed their hcg follow up i think this is yeah this is my last slide is the use of exogenous estrogen and other fertility drugs safe for women undergoing arts after molar pregnancy yes the use of exogenous estrogens and any other form of fertility medications that is gonadotropins clomiphenes uh this is safe once the hcg levels it has returned back to normal so we should wait for hcg level to return back to normal before giving her any form of fertility drugs and even the same is is with hrts so hrts may be used once hcg levels have returned back to normal so i just compiled compiled few numbers here uh the risk of gtd in uk is 1 in 714 risk of gtn after live birth is 1 in 50000 uh the requirement of chemotherapy in complete mole is 13 to 16% in partial mole it is 0.5 to 1% gtn developing after therapeutic abortion is 1 in 20000 twins with one viable and one molar pregnancy there can be early fetal loss in 40% premature birth in 36 36% preeclampsia in 20% cure rate with a figo score of 6 or less is 100% cure rate with a score of 7 or more is 94% and once mole the chances of future mole is 1% 1 in 100 so these are some important numbers i have compiled them up and uh i hope the things are clear to you in case any doubts uh you can ask me or you can put it in the group also in the telegram group we will be doing solving few questions i hope uh you all are ready to answer those so this is the oh, sorry sorry this is the first question i had you all can read and just message okay the first the answer uh, uh okay i'll just uh, read out the question 
uh, female who has uh, presented with hypermesis and bleeding to the gynae department. Ultrasound suggests a complete molar pregnancy, and this is confirmed by histological analysis of evacuated products. What is the karyotype of sperm that fertilize the oocyte? So it is 23X. It is the, tw they are asking the karyotype of the sperm, okay? So it is, yeah, it is 23X because they are asking the karyotype of the sperm. The sperm, it uh, fertilizes with the oocyte and then it duplicates its own chromosome. So the karyotype of the sperm will become 23X. Okay, and if it is a partial mole, a woman attends to the routine dating scan at 12 weeks and there are cystic spaces with a small fetus, partial mole, we all know most likely a uh, karyotype in partial mole is 69 XXY, this one, okay? So it is 69 XXY. And uh, uh, a recent migraine to the UK developed shortness of breath, vaginal bleeding, and chest X-ray showed multiple nodules. So it is a choriocarcinoma. The most likely diagnosis here is Again, 46, it is, uh, it is most likely from the molar pregnancy, okay? So it is 46XX. We know that in 65 uh, to 70% of the cases, it is 46XX. So the portion of partial moles which are triploid in nature, we know that 90% of the partial moles, they are, why not 23Y? Okay, 23Y, uh, just a second, 23Y, it never duplicates its own chromosome. 2046YY is not compatible. It is never ever seen, okay? And the sperm has to duplicate its own chromosome, okay? I hope it is clear. They are asking what is the karyotype of the sperm that fertilize the oocyte. So they are talking about a single sperm over here. If the two sperms, they fuse together with the empty ova, then it results in 46XY, diploid molar, okay? But here they are asking the karyotype of the sperm which fertilized with oocyte. So it is the 23X which fertilized with the oocyte and then it duplicated it its own chromosome, okay? I hope it's clear. So the portion of partial mole which are triploid in nature, they are 90% of the partial moles are triploid in nature and 10% are tetraploid or mosaic pattern. This is from another GTG. Uh, the portion of ectopic pregnancies that are cervical, it is less than 1% and uh, the miscarriage rate at uh, 35 to 39 years, it is 25%. This is not related to this. It was just, I wanted to, because these numbers, they are important and we get confused with it, okay? Okay, so a journal practitioner calls to ask about immediate follow-up of a woman who had suction evacuation of complete molar pregnancy. What will you advise? How, what advice will you give? Yeah. So this patient needs to be followed up with HCG levels every two weeks for eight weeks. If the if HCG levels, it falls back to normal within eight weeks, then further follow up for six months is required from the day of evacuation. However, if HCG level does not fall back within eight weeks, then it has to be followed for six months from the day of normalization. Okay. A woman has evacuation of partial molar pregnancy. She was 11 weeks. What is your follow-up plan? Yeah, definitely. So here in partial mole, we are doing HCG every two weeks. One, once it becomes normal, then uh, another sample after four weeks is required. Okay, so two uh, values four weeks apart should be normal in partial mole. And here, complete mole, partial mole, we all know that it is 13 to 16% now, and it is 0.5 to 1% here, okay? Yeah. 
great. So here the FIGO score is six. What is the drug of choice? single agent intramuscular methotrexate with alternating with folinic acid for eight days, then six days rest. Yes, excellent. Okay. A 41 year old patient diagnosed with gestation trophoblastic neoplasia, six months. Yeah, exactly. So here, the HCG level, we are, the FIGO score comes out to be less than six here, okay? It is 10 raised to power three to 10 raised to power four. So one point here, one number here, and uh, lung metastasis is zero. So this is the correct answer. Great. Which is not an example of gestation trophoblastic disease. Yeah, chorioangioma is not a gestation trophoblastic disease, right? Okay, about molar pregnancy. Complete mole usually half of 75 to 80% arise as a co consequence of diasmomic fertilization. Complete mole half, 10% of molar partial moles, they are tetraploid or mosaic. Okay, so normally complete mole 75 to 80% are a consequence of fertilization of single sperm with empty ova and then duplication. Okay, in 25 to 30%, it is like diaspermic fertilization. So this is wrong. Complete mole do not have red blood cells. Partial mole mostly result from diaspermic fertilization. So in all the cases, they result from those. This is also wrong. And this is also wrong because mostly seven, so this is ulta here, okay. I hope you got it. Which of the following are two about combined hormonal contraception use after GTG? Yeah, it's not associated with, it's not associated with additional risk. It is not associated with additional risk. Combined hormonal contraceptive pills are category one now, okay? They can be used, yes, great. So thank you all for patience listening. I hope the session was helpful to you. And uh, any doubts you can just post in the Telegram group. And yes, we are coming up with a marathon course. Uh, Dr. Rashmi and me. So we'll be revising all the guidelines, important guidelines, nice guidelines, talk articles. It will be a 10-day course and it will start from 20th June, okay? And uh, it will be, every day it will be three to four hour session will be there. Any doubts and regarding this course, you can uh, just message on this number and uh, looking forward and we'll be coming with many new free sessions also and group activities we'll also be doing so dia you can ask on this number you can direct message dr rashmi you can just have a word yeah yeah hi dear thank you so much dr yeah. it's such a wonderful informative and uh, exam oriented session it was really helpful and mm -hmm. i think the concepts okay. were crystal clear and uh, yeah. I would also like to thank Dr. Prabhu Mustafa, sir, for joining in with us in the session. So you're yeah. doing a really thank great you, job in thank your you, group. Sir. Thank you, and so much. Yeah. I think you're helping thousands of MRCUG aspirants there. And uh, thank you, sir. I really appreciate that. And um, we, Dr. Rashmi and Dr. Geetika, will continue to conduct the free sessions in the future. And uh, about the course, she has already told. So any doubt you have, you can just uh, uh, directly message us or put it in the Telegram group. So we'll answer that. After this, we will also announce a regular course for two months, which will be there for the September 2021 batch, and it will start from the July 21. It will be announced soon in the group. So take care, all of you. Be safe and happy studying. Lots of love and luck. And signing off here, Dr. Geetika and Dr. Rashmi. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Good night. Good night. Thank you.
थैंक यू ओके